Good morning. I'll tell you what, these farm people, they get up at an ungodly hour. They get up before the sun comes up. My general rule is that if the sun is not participating, then neither am I. Uh, Farmer Garland and Gracia, who I did a video on a couple months ago, they are in Biloxi, gambling no doubt, uh, with their RV. So they are not here right now, but I have taken their space. <laughs> The war wagon is parked underneath the barn and I got all set up. I finally conquered my fear of towing up the mountains. I was terrified to do that. I just, reporters try to get a lot of information and so I just was reading so much about people's brakes and tires catching on fire and if the, if the you know, rig started doing this, like what was I gonna do and ah. And so I just didn't want to tow up mountains and, and that was it. And, <laughs> and I finally got over it. Bob made the Smoky Mountains his bitch. Bob can go up a telephone pole. I mean, and that said, when I was, I had 11,000 pounds, you know, up these inclines and the Smoky Mountains are not even, you know, some of the steeper. Uh, but when you feel the truck work and you can feel the sound of that engine, if you gave me a gas truck to pull an RV, I would give it back to you. I don't know why. I mean, these are just designed for it. And so I finished the tow. I got up here. I'm like, you know, feeling myself. And I called the electrician, Michael, and I said, Michael, I love Bob. I love Bob so much. This may be the most committed relationship I've ever been in. But now I'm kind of thinking I want a 3500, like even more power. And he said that... Um, the engine is the same. There's differences elsewhere, but it's really uh, not big beyond that. So uh, I am spent <laughs> after yesterday, all those nerves. I will also say something that is not getting discussed too terribly much, uh, at least on the travel channels I watch, is that even in states that are reopened, I've been in South Carolina now, Georgia now, and Tennessee, uh, where they have been reopened for a while. As far as tourism goes, most everything is still shut down in some capacity. And so everything on my bucket list that I wanted to explore with you all uh, while I was up here, revisiting my baby moos who are angry teenagers now. They just grow up so fast. <laughs> Look at how many there are. They were just a tiny baby smoke hound the last time I saw them. And now they're mean as hell. It's all still closed. So we're really limited. And with that said, if you are home and just feeling like you're missing out on all your wanderlust, I'm here to tell you that right now is a difficult time to travel. And I am not typically um, dependent upon tourism locations. I find my own thing. But in order to get the story out about an area or a town or something that you find, you still need people around. <laughs> and if those businesses are not open, if those visitor centers are not open, uh, you really are, you're going to have a hard time. So while I'm thrilled to be back out from the illegal storage unit that I was in for six months, getting the sunshine, seeing my moves, seeing my friends, uh, it, it's a tough time to travel. It really is. And, and there's a lot of volatility uh, with places shutting back down now because the virus numbers are back up. And so, again, if you feel like you're just totally missing out, um, I will be the sacrificial lamb and go try to find the stories for you while you stay safe uh, at home. Anyway, uh, because all the things I wanted to do are not open right now, I looked at Asheville, which I used to live in Asheville. I worked at the Biltmore Estate when I was in college, and uh, that's not terribly close to here. I'm not that excited about being in the car again, but it's open-ish, not everything, but open. The irony about the Biltmore Estate is that I worked there I was there almost every single day. I helped manage the stable cafe, which is the restaurant, and then I did weddings at the inn. We're gonna have to do a little drive and talk for the rest of this, because I am severely behind. And I remember from working at the Biltmore Estate that it just gets filled up with tourists. So the irony of my time at the Biltmore Estate, given my love of old houses, is that I never went in the house. <laughs> I worked there, I was there like seven days a week and I never stepped foot in the house. And I think it was because I hated the job so much because it involved people. I had to be around all these tourists all the time. It wore me out. Uh, 
Anyway, so I was gonna tell you quick the story of how I got hired at the Biltmore Estate. <laughs> how I tricked the Biltmore estate into hiring me. And then we're gonna go see this beautiful house, which I'm, it's, I believe it's America's largest home. I think that's it. You'd think I would know. I went through all the employee training. Uh, so I started college at Barnard College in New York City. And I hated it. I hated college completely. I thought it was a total ripoff that I give you $100,000 and I get zero guarantee of anything on the back end. Uh, so I transferred after my first semester, and that's really rare. I'm sorry, it's probably really dark right now, but um, Garland has a jungle at the end of his farm. Uh, I transferred to the University of Delaware, and because I was a freshman transfer, and they don't know what to do with you when you're a freshman transfer, there was also no housing. They put me in senior housing at the edge of campus, and it was like an apartment I shared with some girl. And so I didn't have a meal plan. I just, I cooked in the apartment. And not too terribly long into my stint there, we had a horrible snowstorm and I couldn't go grocery shopping. And so I was like running out of food and I was hungry. <laughs> I remembered that the hotel restaurant management college, like the school within a school, when they had events, they had the best food because they had their own commercial kitchen. Uh, you know what, I'll just stop and finish this story, lest I run into a tractor. They had their own commercial kitchen on campus, so they always had really nice food at their events. And they were having a career fair that week, and I was out of food. <laughs> they usually leave the food outside of the conference room, so I was just gonna show up in my snowsuit, I put like little Ziploc baggies and stuff in my pockets, grab some food, <laughs> like a little raccoon and then be on my way right uh, I get there and I don't blend in quite as good as I need to because they're all in business suits it's so funny to me to see college students in business suits they look like they got played dress up in their parents closet so they're all like professional and I'm got my snow hat and my jacket my snowboard pants on and I am just there to get fed <laughs> And so I get my food and then I thought, well, what the hell? You know, I don't know who these people are. They're not, I was studying uh, biomedical engineering. <laughs> Doesn't that sound smart? So I didn't care, like these were the hotel kids. I just started walking around the tables now that I had a belly full of food that wasn't mine. And there I, I came down one of the rows and there was this huge cardboard cutout of the Biltmore Estate. I had never seen it before. And I had never seen a house like that. And I don't know what it was about that image, but I was like, whatever that is, I have to be by it. And so it was a, it was a food and beverage internship. I was in biomedical engineering. <laughs> Do the math on that. So I remember the guy's name was Todd, Todd. And I shook his hand in my snowsuit and I was like, yeah, that looks amazing. What are you hiring for? And he gave me the papers and all that. I had no, I, it was not my major. I was there stealing their food. And for the next several months, I hounded that man as though I deserved to be there. I mean, I called him and called him and call, and he never answered. I remember he never answered and just pestered the shit out of that guy. And then sometime in the spring, he called and said, congratulations, you got the internship. <laughs> I knew nothing about hospitality or, I mean, me really, hospitality. Hotel restaurant management, I had never done inventory, like nothing, no clue, zero. I didn't care. I was going to that big house. And so I spent a summer in Asheville uh, just <laughs> managing the stable cafe and then I worked at the inn. I did room service for a while. Room service was perfect for me because you bring the food up, you drop the food off and then they give you cash and then you go away. You don't have to entertain them. I will also tell you that an alarming number of people answer the door naked at room service. But $20 is $20 so I really didn't care. Room service, I mean I did everything in there and uh, and I really didn't want to leave, but thank God I did because Asheville has gotten really hippy dippy since then. And I wouldn't really fit in with that. <laughs> Anywho, uh, I never went to the house. I never saw the house. So we're gonna get back in Bob and huff it back over the mountains. 
and uh, and do some exploring to kind of catch up on the thing that I never took advantage of while I was there. I also remember it was a small fortune, and that was in God. When was I, I was in college? Ages ago. I think I think we were still in the barter system. <laughs> then it doesn't matter we're gonna go life is short let's do the thing okay bye the drive past the gate guard feels more like I'm heading into work but this time I need a ticket once upon a 2003 that ticket cost about 45 bucks I nearly needed to be resuscitated when I saw the new prices $70 for a basic walkthrough 90 for an audio tour for $90, my name better be carved somewhere next to Vanderbilt's. On these tours, you won't learn much about the construction or the family who is appropriately represented here by these headless mannequins. So let me save you some money by telling you the backstory so you can really get the most out of your visit. I'm on the hunt for the story that built America's largest privately owned home. Seeking guidance first from Diana, goddess of the hunt, follow her gaze down the immaculate lawn, and there it is. Welcome to the Biltmore Estate. This shot may look familiar. It's one of the very first scenes in the 1994 movie Richie Rich, or it looks familiar because this is where everyone takes their selfie. At 25 years old, George Vanderbilt, grandson to industrialist Cornelius Vanderbilt, hiked up to an overlook here and said humbly, I would like to own everything I can see. And so he did, a nice little lot of about 125,000 acres. Biltmore is a fabricated word coming from built, his Dutch surname, and more an Anglo-Saxon word for rolling open land. 1,000 craftsmen started work in 1889 and labored for six years to ensure it would open on Christmas Day. The men built a special railroad track from the main railway to the construction site to haul materials. No big deal, I mean, Granddaddy Cornelius owned most of them. Biltmore looks like a solid stone castle, but it's all siding. At heart, it's a brick and steel framed structure with limestone facade. The stone came from Indiana, was cut into blocks, and then lowered into place by a rudimentary crane. Only after it was down and set was it shaped, or carved, into any of the many faces of the welcoming committee staring back at you. I asked the staff, what happened if you made a mistake after the stone was set? The answer is, you don't make a mistake. Covering four acres worth of floor space, there is incredibly only one known boo-boo in the limestone. I won't ruin the surprise. You can find it when you get here. Pop quiz. What is the difference between a grotesque and a gargoyle? A grotesque is a stone fantasy figure, usually surrounded by floral on pillars. A gargoyle projects outward from a wall. These are decorative, but most are used to shoot water away from the foundation. Believed to ward off evil spirits, you can usually find them at lookout points. Each slate roof tile was attached one by one, wired onto the steel infrastructure, then copper flashing to protect against water. You know you're fancy when you can afford to have your initials embossed into your flashing. Even fancier if they're highlighted in gold leaf, but that's all gone now. Because of coronavirus, I'm relegated to the outside for several hours before I can get in, which gave me ample time to explore the grounds. The gardens were designed by the man behind Central Park, Frederick Olmsted. We've heard that name at many of the Gilded Age mansions that we've been to, and he was a favorite of the Vanderbilts. When Olmsted saw his new project, both he and George noted how terribly sparse and undernourished the land was. Olmsted worked with foresters to plant millions of trees, an effort that led to the founding of the U.S. Forest Service. When Biltmore was listed on the National Register of Historic Places in 1966, it was less because of the house and more because of the forest. 
Biltmore Estate was inspired by French Renaissance chateaus, as George was an avid world traveler. On the outside, that checks out with towers and elaborate dormers. Inside, George got a bit American and a bit bachelor pad. That's right, for three years, this was his single guy man cave until he married Edith. He nailed French interior design with prominent chimney pieces and tapestry, but traditionally, French Renaissance is rich with this feeling of romanticism, almost whimsical. Sparse furnishings with big, bright spaces, golds, aquamarine blues, creams, and pinks. Biltmore is, well, dark, with leather-lined walls and heavy colors. It's also quite literally dark. I went through considerable lengths to lighten these photos so you could actually see the place. We get some relief in Edith's bedroom where a rogue shade of bright yellow somehow snuck inside. Thank you, Edith. Of the 250 rooms, let's break that down to 35 bedrooms, 43 bathrooms, 65 fireplaces. The glass domed winter garden was the first room to welcome guests to Biltmore. Dinner guests were entreated to take out. Oh no, 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 no. They sat underneath a 70 foot ceiling in a banquet hall whose fireplace is so large I could barely fit it in my wide angle lens. The food came from down below on a series of dumb waiters, a household feature I have no idea why we got rid of. Who said, no, let's just carry everything, and someone else agreed. Those copper pots hanging, those are the family's original collection. And this was quite the modern kitchen and home. Biltmore had refrigeration, hot water, working bathrooms, two elevators, and a call system that covered every room in the house. The only thing that separated it from a hotel was that it didn't have a pool. No, 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 yes it did. Of course it did. Floor to ceiling tiled indoor pool holding 70,000 gallons. The last time they filled it, they found those 70,000 gallons in the basement below. Century old tile and grout does leak. But the lights still work. Yes, underwater lights in the late 1800s, a time when most homes were still using candles. No one was sure whether AC or DC current would become the household standard, so George Vanderbilt just had them wire the entire house with both. Like many ultra mansions, the first floor throws out all the stops, and things get simpler as we move up into the family's private rooms and guest areas. Grab a book from George's 2300 volume collection. Pick something high up so you can use this gorgeous mobile ladder. To get upstairs, we take the showstopper. I have a special love of staircase more than any other part of a home. Staircases are the one space in any house that unite everyone inside it. The wealthy owner to the servants all stepped foot here. On our staircases, we bring newborns up them and the deceased down them. Whenever I'm in a historic home, I stop on the first step and take hold of the banister. Now my foot is where George's foot was. My hand is where Edith's was. I now overlap years and generations of family, friends, and guests, all in the exact same position and place, separated only by a few turns of the clock. Notice, there's not a single support underneath this expansive limestone spiral staircase. Each step is a solid, singular piece of stone that is cantilevered, counterbalanced, by offsetting its weight with the outdoor staircase. It is a marvel of physics. The 1,700-pound electric chandelier hangs from a single bolt, funneling through the steel girders. After George died, Edith kept the home and its farms running until the Great Depression when many European and American mansions decided to open to the public to support their extraordinary maintenance costs. Since then, millions of people have walked these halls. Travel advisory. At the time of this video, coronavirus cases are rising and North Carolina tourism is still largely shut down. Only allowing 10 people per room, the tour slots fill up very fast. Buy your tickets well in advance. You will be rushed through each room to maintain those numbers. 
masks are mandatory, and most of the accessory buildings are closed. It was called the Gilded Age because while glimmering on the surface, a small scratch would reveal the unpolished, read corrupt, nature of how the wealth was made. The Vanderbilts linked the United States by rail, made a fortune, but sometimes did so by shutting down bridges, holding rails ransom, or giving the stock market a heart attack when Cornelius didn't get his way. The tycoons of our history are something of a two-sided coin, so to speak. What is undeniable about them and their resources is that they all left behind architecture reflecting a sense of vision and craftsmanship that we may never see again. <laughs>